Welcome to another Observability Lab. Today we dive deep into how to set up the Dynatrace live debugging capabilities, a step-by-step -step guide so that you and your developers can really enable live debugging as we've shown you in the previous two sessions. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, check out the links because Josh has already done two end-to-end -end demos. And Josh, thank you so much for being back. And now today it's really about how do people really get started how to enable it, settings, uh, diving deeper into what people need to know. So, Josh, thanks for being back, and uh, yeah, let's get started. Yeah, perfect. Thanks again for having me, Andy. So, yeah, as you mentioned, want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the setup behind the Live Debugger. So, it's a new capability Dynatrace has recently introduced, and want to talk a little bit about what you need to have in place and some of the settings and configuration that you need to turn on to make it make it all work. Um, so there's a couple things to keep in mind. You do need to be on Dynatrace SaaS and have DPS licensing, and then you'll just work with your uh, account executive uh, and, and the team there to make sure it's added uh, to your DPS contract. Once you've done that, we currently have support for Java and Node.js applications. And so if you're running one of those, then you, you should be good to start using it. Other languages like .NET will be coming a little bit later. So where I'll start off is taking a look at uh, how you actually go about turning this on in terms of configuring some of the settings and things you need to keep in mind there. So there's uh, a new component that you need to enable within the active gate. So within the active gate, you'll need to, of course, upgrade that to the latest version. And you'll need to turn on this debugging module. Uh, the setting is right here. It just sets debugging enabled equals true. You need to do that within the custom.properties file restart it and uh, everything should be good there you need to make sure you're on the latest one agent version mm -hmm. nothing else that needs to be configured uh, outside of the one agent uh, there are a few things to keep in mind for example node.js you may need to include source maps but other than that there's nothing at the code level that you need to configure it's just making sure you have one agent running on the system where you want to actually use the live debugger and then in just a second we'll, we'll actually jump into the settings and take a look at some of these things but you'll need to turn on the live debugger capability uh, across your tenant and you'll also need to turn on the one agent feature for the specific language that you'd like to use live debugger with mm -hmm. java or node.js for example show you where where, where those are uh, and then coupled with that in terms of how you turn this on uh, you have the ability to also set policies that go along with those which basically means you can set who can uh, define and set breakpoints, who can manage breakpoints, and the relative permissions associated with those. We'll also talk just briefly about how you can scope this to specific process groups, for example. So you don't have to turn it on everywhere. You can turn it on in specific places that you want to use it in. Uh, and then lastly, we'll, we'll talk just a little bit about the live debugging desktop app. If you want to load up a source code repository that you already have cloned locally on your machine, you can use the desktop app. Um, but of course, you can also connect directly to the Git repo that you might be using. And so with that, I think let's jump right into it and take a look at some of these settings within Dynatrace. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So here we are in the Dynatrace settings screen. And there's a couple settings that I'll, I'll point out in terms of what you need to turn on. So first off, you'll notice this new section down here called Observability for Developers. And so that's going to contain the Enable Observability for Developers toggle and the setting associated with that. This basically will turn uh, developer uh, Observability for Developers on across the entire tenant. So if you want it to, to be turned on across every service that you have available, you can turn it on here. This toggle is what also starts the billing. Uh, so you know when you turn this on, uh, the, the DPS billing is going to start. And the other setting that I had mentioned is this one agent feature. And so you'll also need to turn that on. And if you search for debugger, you'll see these new settings. So I could turn on the live debugger for Java or Node.js or both. Uh, you just toggle those on. Note that when you toggle this on specifically for, for Java, it tells you whether you need a restart uh, of your one agent and your services or not. For Java, you do. Node.js, you, you don't. So you turn those two capabilities on. Uh, and they can be scoped across the entire tenant like we've done here. Mm -hmm. Or what I could also do is I could go into a specific process group, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was looking to just enable this on maybe a set of critical services that I want to have this capability for, I can go and turn it on just at the process group level. And that way it's scoped just, just, to, some, just to those services that I want to use it for. Mm -hmm. And that's also, I guess, a very 
common use case then, right? If you have certain services in, let's say, production environment and you want to then enable it for particular services, then just turn it on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, you know, I think uh, each organization needs to kind of look at how they want to, to roll this out, how they want to enable it. Mm -hmm. We've given the capabilities so that really you can scope it as broadly or as fine grained as you want to to start. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then so coupled with with these settings here, uh, I'll, I'll want to look at the policies as well. So you also need to define uh, some some IAM policies and I'm just going to jump into the policy screen here. And so I have all of the policies that I have set and I've defined a couple policies, uh, one for the live debugger allowing setting of breakpoints and one for allowing managing of breakpoints. And so you can come in here and I can look at the policy. You'll want to check the documentation for the latest on which exact permissions you'll need to add for which purposes. But for example, I've set one up that allows a developer to set breakpoints and one that allows them to manage those breakpoints or any admin users to manage those breakpoints. And then you, you bind these to a specific group, make sure the developers you want to use this capability are part of that group, and then you should be good to go. Questions on that, Andy? Uh, no, very good. I, I really like it that you can do this, that fine grain, so you can really specify who is allowed to set the breakpoints. And um, folks, again, if you have not seen the demos, check out the demos as well, because when we talk about setting breakpoints, you will better understand what this is all about. I hope you've watched the demo videos first and now this one to uh, get a little bit of a deep dive on how to enable all of this um, and also kind of enable these capabilities in the organization for particular users or for particular services. Yeah. Other than that, all good? Yeah, perfect. And so when I say setting breakpoints or managing breakpoints, let me just jump into the live debugger here, here quickly. Uh, and, and so if you have the set breakpoint uh, policy on, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to come in, click on a line of code, set one of these non-breaking breakpoints, as you saw in some of the prior videos, and then collect data anytime that that non-breaking breakpoint is hit. And the, on the other side of things, if you have the manage breakpoint settings, you will see this new screen up here at the top that allows you to go in and manage all of the breakpoints across your organization, not just your own breakpoints, but let's say somebody else has set a breakpoint in a production environment and they went on vacation or they left mm -hmm. the company and you wanted to come in here and turn this off. You can, of course, come in and manage all of those from a single place as long as you have that, that managed policy. Cool. And uh, Josh, maybe out of curiosity, I would assume that in most organizations you would have uh, the developers that need the breakpoints probably just have the setting their breakpoint and then you have like, more like some admin teams maybe um, yeah. used to manage. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So kind of everyday, you know, power users that just want to be able to, to debug, to collect mm -hmm. data, um, just use it kind of a normal basis. You can have that and then the admins who want to be able to manage things on a broader level can have cool. that, that managed setting. In conjunction with that as well, by the way, you may also want to keep in mind that if you're setting breakpoints in areas where you have sensitive data, mm -hmm. uh, you may also want to have the, the data masking capability yeah. Yeah. set up. And so as an admin, you can define those rules as well. Yeah, I've received, uh, I was at KubeCon last week and we had a lot of discussions around this. And this was a, you know, a very common question. So how can you configure that not everything is captured because there might be sensitive data. So this is exactly the, the place to configure it. Yeah. Exactly. And so, yeah. And so once those have been defined, admins can, can, can build out those rules and say, the, this data needs to be redacted either based on an, a variable name in your mm -hmm. code. For example, if you don't have a, a predetermined format of what the data should look like, like a password field, for example, mm -hmm. you can reference variable names in your code. And anytime we see those variables, we'll automatically redact that data for you. Or you can take the other approach where we scan the data itself and look for credit card numbers or any other type of, of sensitive data. And anytime we match those patterns, automatically redact that data uh, from the, the snapshots that mm -hmm. we're capturing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, last couple things that I'll, that I'll show some of the additional configuration that we didn't really get into in the last videos. What we were looking at in the last videos was how do I set a breakpoint, take a look at the snapshot, analyze the data um, and, and, and look at things from there. But there are also a couple more advanced things that you can do with some of these breakpoints. For example, I could right click on any breakpoint that I configure and I can bring up some advanced settings which allow me to configure a few additional settings on the breakpoints themselves. 
And so those include some things like maybe setting conditions, mm -hmm. right? So may, maybe when I'm debugging, I'm looking for some specific set of data, or I'm looking for a transaction that matches some condition that I want to capture data for. So I could come in and I could, uh, based on the variable or a specific variable in my code, I could set a condition. For example, I have a divide by zero exception that I'm looking for in this case, and I want to capture snapshots where the divider variable is zero. Mm -hmm. Right, so I can set those conditions up to build and look for exactly what it is that I'm looking for. I mean, this alone is just so great. If I remember my times where uh, you debug through code and you try to figure out when is this code being hit with a particular value in a variable to then go into a certain path of the of the code execution. I mean, it's just phenomenal what you've what this is, what this can do. Yeah, just excited. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're running this in production, right? You have mm -hmm. a high, very high throughput environment. There's a lot of data flowing through these systems. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to to pinpoint exactly what it is yeah. that you're looking for instead of having to filter through it. Yeah. And folks, maybe again, a reminder, because you just mentioned production, we're talking about non-breaking breakpoints here. That means as compared to debugging that you may know from a development point of view, when you are in your local environment and you debug, you basically pause the runtime, whether it's the JVM uh, or any other runtime. In this case, non-breaking breakpoint means the agent is capturing the data, but it's not stopping the runtime, but it's capturing the same depth of data that you can then use to analyze um, as, as if you would debug locally, but yeah. Exactly, that's an important distinction to make. It comes up on most calls I have with customers. Does it actually stop the application like a traditional debugger does? doesn't do that, but it behaves in a similar way that allows you to kind of collect the data where that you where wherever you need it. Um, last couple things here is right. You can also set some limits on how much data is captured. So you can have it run. Maybe you have a bug that happens at two in the morning, right? And you mm -hmm. want to be able to 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 find that data. So you can set a breakpoint, have it run for twenty four hours or have it run for capturing the next one hundred transactions and then automatically turn off. So you have some uh, control over how and when we, we collect data so that you can make it a little bit easier to find exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And what's the collection collection level? It says medium there. And so this is uh, something that allows us to define basically how deep in the stack we go for collecting um, data. So a as you can imagine, you may have different elements and objects, arrays uh, within your application, and you can kind of drill into those and kind of drill deeper and deeper. And so this basically defines how deep in the stack we mm -hmm. go in terms of collecting some of that data, right? Obviously, uh, the more data that you collect, um, the the you know greater impact. Although the impact on the application is very very small, um, you can just think of that, right? Maybe you you want to collect less data in some cases. Maybe you want to collect more data because you have very deeply nested elements. Mm -hmm. So you have control over exactly how you do that with with some of these settings, or you can explicitly collect variables that may be deeper in the stack that, than we normally go. You could actually right click on something and and say, hey, I, I want to collect this variable explicitly the next time it runs, if it was deeper than what we would normally collect. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, of, a lot of control and customization over how and what it is that we collect. It's and as you just had the, um, the menu open, can you right click again? Because yep. you said there is the collect variable, that means you would then, we would then collect it the whole, all, all the way through. What is the watch component? Yeah, so the watch allows you to add something to the table over here. So maybe I want to watch, for example, the, the trace ID and take a look at those. So I could click watch and it would show up in the menu here and allow me to, to search. Right? Yeah, so I could cool. type in and start searching for specific data that I'm uh -huh. looking for and filter that. So it's a nice way to, to kind of capture something and then maybe you're looking for specific data within that transaction, mm -hmm. filter on it. And so you can use conditions to filter before we collect the data or you can use the search here to filter after we collect the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, and I think that's that's really it for for the most part as far as the configuration I wanted to show. Anything else uh, or other questions, Andy? From your uh, no, I think last time you showed how to connect to your Git repository. Uh, also, just a reminder, this is a view here that is baked into the Dynatrace uh, UI, but we also have an integration with Visual Studio Code and IntelliJ. So if your developers rather like to debug in their IDE of choice, then they can do this as well. And uh, no, I think um, from my perspective, this is great. So if you have Dynatrace, uh, it requires Dynatrace SAS, as we said, the DPS uh, license contract, 
and then you can enable this on your tenant, you can enable this on individual services or processes, you can give people access to it, uh, so that means there is a, a access control on setting the breakpoints and managing the breakpoints. I think we've seen it all, we've, we've seen everything that we need to know on how to get started, yeah. Perfect, perfect. And I did, I know I mentioned the desktop app in the earlier slides. So the desktop app is the one piece that you would need to, to install if you wanted to connect to a local repository that you have. So in order to do that, you just click on the, the debug configuration button, you, you click next, and then there'll be this local file system option or one of the other Git repositories that you might want to connect into. The first time you click on it, it'll ask you to download the desktop app. Perfect. That'll allow you to load up those those repositories that you might have locally, or you can, of course, always just connect into whatever else you might be using directly using uh, a personal access token, for example, to authenticate. Yeah, and also what I learned the other time we did the session together, if you are connecting to a Git repository, no code, no source code is ever sent to Dynatrace. Everything is just shown here locally in your browser session. So that means when you set the breakpoint, when you debug through it, all the code you see here, it never leaves your environment, right? Could, could exactly. Say, correct, yeah. That's an important distinction to make, yeah. So everything and every time we connect into, let's say, Bitbucket, what we do is we'll use a personal access token, let's say, uh, connect into that from the developer's workstation directly, clone the repository mm -hmm. on, their, on their laptop, based on whichever repository and branch or commit they wanted. And all of that happens within your network behind your firewall. None of the source code, as you mentioned, ever goes outside of yeah. your network. So it happens locally. Cool. Josh, thank you so much for walking us through how to get started with the live debugger. This time really focusing on some of the settings that we haven't covered in the demos. And folks, again, if you want to see an end-to-end -end demo, then check out the links in the video description. We've done two. One um, that was focusing on, well, both of them were focusing on the same app. Uh, the, um, the one was also focusing on open telemetry. Uh, so we have uh, two versions of, of the demo, one looking into open telemetry traces as well, and the other one uh, just uh, the general live debugging feature. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Good. Perfect. Josh, thank you so much. and. Uh, See you next time. I'm sure you will be back. And everybody else, uh, enjoy live debugging. Thanks, Andy. Bye-bye.